afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Governor Wilson, thank you, Fred. Uh, Perry, thank you for your leadership in uh, regards to Proposition 1. Uh, the second half of the meeting, as we mentioned before, we're going to have a candidate forum today where we're going to highlight uh, Sarah Walsh and Michaela Skelton, uh, potentially running, or I should say potentially, you guys are running, uh, for 50th District uh, Representative seat. Uh, let me share with you a little bit about the uh, format we're going to use. Um, the candidates are going to introduce themselves for two minutes, and then each candidate will then respond to a series of questions. I think we've had ten questions that I will pose to them, and you'll be allowed two minutes to respond to each question. We do have a timer here that will share with you where you're at with regard to that two minutes. Um, and following the chamber questions, we'll allow uh, Depending upon where we are time-wise, we may allow some uh, closing remarks, which will end up being uh, about two minutes on your behalf. So if you guys are ready to go, we'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, first question. Um, if elected to office, what will be the first piece of legislation or policy yeah, position? Introduction. Introduction. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm way ahead. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Let's do introduction, okay? <laughs> Michaela, why don't you start? You'll have two minutes for your sure. introduction. Thank you. So my name is Michaela Skelton, and I am the Democratic candidate for Missouri's 50th House District. Our special election is August the 8th, so we're just a little bit less than four weeks away from the election. Um, I like to tell a little story to kind of introduce myself and, and answer that question that everybody always wants to know, why are you running? Um, I grew up in a small rural town in Alabama, just outside of Montgomery, in a military family. My father served 20 years in the Air Force. My mom served three. So service to my community and service to my country has always been a part of who I am since I was a child. And the community that I grew up in was more than a neighborhood, more than a community. It was family, which is so important when you're in a military family because you're away from your relatives and grandparents. Um, and so when we moved to Boone County, we moved here with my, my husband and to raise our children because we found that same kind of close-knit community um, that is always there for you that, that I grew up with. Because when I was a kid, growing up, my parents knew that when my brothers and I went out to go ride bicycles, that the greatest danger we faced were a couple of mean dogs in the back of the neighborhood because every other adult in that neighborhood was watching out for us. And that's, that's the kind of community that we have here in Boone County as well. And that's what I want to see our state legislature be, is part of our community that actually helps to look out for us and fill gaps when there's a need. Um, and when I graduated from law school and I took a job with the Missouri State Senate, I thought that that's what I was going to be doing, helping real people solve real problems by working with both Democratic and Republican senators to write good bills that worked well. Um, and it turned out that I only really ever got one assignment like that because most of the things that actually came across my desk and the ones that actually moved were bills that were hand delivered to me by corporate lobbyists. And those were the bills that moved and those were the ones that it was clear that the people that owned those bills were not the senators or the representatives whose names were on the bills. It was the lobbyists, and they were picking winners and losers in our economy instead of making sure it was fair for everyone. And I want to make sure it's fair for everyone. Michaela, thank you. Sarah, you'll have two minutes. I'm Sarah Walsh, and I'm running as the Republican candidate in the special election August 8th. I grew up right here in mid-Missouri. My parents moved from California State back in 1986 to honestly just to have less crime and to just grow up in the heartland of America. My mom always wanted to grow up in a country. My dad installed carpet and floor covering for a living. And so they packed up a van and moved us out. So my parents struggled paycheck to paycheck throughout my childhood. So as we, you know, as I lived my childhood, we moved from home to home and rented until they finally were able to afford to buy. Growing up in mid-Missouri, um, it, it, it's, it's amazing how uh, again, although my parents were not able to afford um, to s support my education, um, they encouraged me with that hard work ethic that I saw at a young age. And as I became an adult and went into the workforce, I, uh, you know, s started, you know, I'm paying for things myself. I've been a customer of Central Bank for uh, 20 years, and I love that heartland feeling. And, and, and we can go into their bank. Shelter Insurance has covered me for 20 years as well. And what I've seen in the businesses is there is that, that love and that, and that care for the community. So many spo sponsorships in the community that our businesses do, and that means so much to me. Um, so as a state representative, I want to work hard for businesses 
and I want to work hard to ensure that the opportunities that are there will still exist. I uh, work full time through my college and undergraduate, both my undergraduate and master's degree. I earned my master's degree at the University of Missouri here in Columbia. And I know what it's like to, again, that hard work ethic I want to put, put forth to you uh, and serve you best in the Missouri legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now for the first question. And Gail, we'll let you start with this. Um, if elected to office, what will be your first piece of legislation or policy position you will sponsor or support? So the first piece that I would like to support, because I think that there, like we were talking about, sales tax being flat in, the, in our local community. And a lot of that has to do with the purchasing power of our workers. And so making sure that we have fair wage laws for our workers uh, here in, in Columbia um, and across the state, which allows people to actually buy the high quality products that our local businesses are offering. Um, so many of the, the larger employers, I mean the largest employer in the state of Missouri is Walmart. Um, and they offer often low wages without real benefits. And so it really puts a strain on our local communities and our local businesses because it makes it difficult for people to be able to buy the high quality goods that our local businesses support and sell. Um, it also makes it hard for our restaurant and our restaurant industry to be able to function well because we don't have as many families that can actually afford to take their, their families out to eat at, in, at dinner time. Um, and so I would like to see our community stand together for our workers because there's really no such thing as a pro-business economy or a pro-worker economy. It's either a good economy that supports good workers and good businesses or a bad economy that supports, uh, that, that supports taking advantage and exploiting our workers and bad actors in business that really take advantage of even our small business owners. And so that's what I would like to see uh, happen in our state legislature. Okay. Thank you very much. Sarah, same question. What will be your first piece of legislation or policy position you will sponsor or support? Well, the first piece of legislation or policy position that I will support will be jobs and economic development. Um, you know, I will not be a candidate. I am not a candidate who will demonize any businesses. As <coughs> growing up again, like I said, poor in rural Missouri, I shopped at Walmart in Elden, Missouri. Um, in fact, I, one of the things I've shared at other events and such is that I actually wore uh, Pittsburgh Steelers clothing into the Walmart in Elden, Missouri. Um, Prices there were affordable, so you know, any time that we could get lower prices, um, we were able to buy more things and so provide for the family rather than buying them at garage sales or you know hand-me-downs again wearing Pittsburgh Steelers uh, clothing from my relatives in Pennsylvania care packages that were sent. So I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to to uh, to wear again hand-me-downs and things like that. But I also know that our businesses, we need, I, I will be an advocate for our businesses because those businesses create jobs, whether it's Walmart or whether it's uh, Central Bank or whether it's any of the businesses. So I will work to ensure that the legislation, I, will, I want to be a collaborator. I want to work with businesses and the chambers and the community and citizens and economic development boards to come together with good policies and good decisions to be able to, again, create jobs in the community and help lift people out of struggling from paycheck to paycheck so that they can lift and rise above that like my family did and like I was able to do. <coughs> Thank you very much. Sarah, we're, we're going to start the second question with you. Um, so what measures would you support to fund new construction and maintenance of the existing interstate highway system? Well, that's a really great question. And I loved earlier um, in, the, in the discussion about the renewal of the county tax because as I've been going door to door throughout the district, one thing that uh, was, was one of the things I know Sh Representative Sheree Reich mentioned earlier about the sunset and how she was glad to have that accountability and to see that. Well, that's what I'm hearing at the doors. And so, so far as uh, with the, uh, with, 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 uh, give me the question again, I'm sorry. That this is, uh, what measures would you support to fund new construction and maintenance of the existing with the roads, absolutely. Yeah, with roads. So, so with uh, with the roads, what it is is that people are telling me again that with paying for the roads, what they don't want is just taxes, taxes that I'm going to go down to Jefferson City and make decisions and just raise raise everyone's taxes. But they want a conversation. So I will be the one who is going to, if there is something that I feel that is, is supported from the evidence that I see in committees, I'm going to bring that back to the district. I'm running as a full-time representative, and so I will advocate for um, policies that are in line with the district, but I will make sure that they sit at the end of the day that every citizen has a voice and that every citizen will make the decisions on raising their taxes. Okay, thank you. And 
detailed? Do you understand the question? What measures would you support to fund new construction and maintenance of the existing air state highway system? Sure. So I think the, the first place that we need to discuss and look at, and it's been a topic of discussion for many sessions in a row in the state legislature, is raising the gas tax. We have the second lowest gas tax of all of the states that border the state of Missouri, um, and we are only outstripped by, I believe it's Arkansas, by two-tenths of a cent. And yet we have the sixth largest state highway system in the country. Um, and so our per mile spending is, is not where it needs to be, uh, particularly since so much of that benefit of, of good roads is going to our rural counties, where without that benefit of state funding for our county roads, um, most of those roads would be have gone back to gravel a long time ago. And it would really be a hidden tax on our rural communities because when you have gravel roads, it causes additional time maintenance. You have to get your tires replaced more frequently. It's a lot rougher on your car. And so that's something that we need to be looking at. But unfortunately, in our state legislature these last several years, despite the fact that MoDOT has alerted them repeatedly to dwindling funds, and we came really close the last two years of not even being able to draw down our federal match dollars because of lack of state highway funding, because of a couple of big lobbies that don't want to see the gas tax increase because it would affect them and so they push off that burden on our local communities where we have to put so much more money forward as the local Boone County Road and Bridge Tax to even just barely maintain our roads instead of being able to use those extra dollars to actually do good projects that can help our help our business help our country or uh, our communities grow and help our businesses be successful um, and so we really need to be holding our legislature accountable um, because they haven't been. They've been doing the bidding of, of big lobby groups that are really putting us at a disadvantage here in Boone County and here in Central Missouri. Okay. I'm gonna to move to the third question. It's gonna deal with job training and I'm gonna let you start this one. Uh, job training is an important part of economic development as is job retention and creation. How would you support local communities in meeting their regional needs? So there are a couple of different avenues, I think, that again, we could be looking at how, how do we get to our job training needs. Um, we have a couple of projects here in, in, in Columbia that are really a great opportunity for job training. Um, it's the expansion of the nuclear reactor project. Um, that would be a, a boon to Columbia because they're producing some of the, the rarest cancer-treating radioactive isotopes, and that's something that our, the whole country could use that could come right here out of our community in Columbia. But unfortunately, again, we don't have the money to do it because we just had to hold back $250 million out of our state budget because we don't have enough money and because there hasn't been that conversation about how do we grow revenue for the state. I mean, we already had to cut prescription drug benefits from 63,000 seniors across the state. We had to cut home health care benefits. And so it's hard to talk about how do we put in these new programs when we can barely afford the ones that we already have in place. You know, it would be great to see fully funding our foundation formula for K-12 schools and making sure that our high schools are getting every single student both job and career and college ready. You know, expanding those technical training programs that used to be so popular in our high schools. Welding classes, wood shop, so that we can train our students to be carpenters and uh, operating engineers and mechanics and welders and all of those things, those, those trade jobs that are still some of the best paying jobs that we have available to folks and yet we're not preparing our high school students to be able to handle those jobs when they graduate. Because college is great and college is wonderful for a lot of people and everyone that wants to go should have an opportunity. But college is not necessarily for everyone and so we should have opportunities available for all of our children to succeed in any way that fits for them. Um, and so that's what I would like to see our community moving forward doing. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. The same question. Job training is an important part of economic development, as is job retention and creation. How would you support local communities in meeting their regional needs? And job training, that's such an important question. What I would do, again, is be very, very present in the community and work through efforts with the chambers, economic development boards, ready boards, to ensure that there's collaboration. Because when you do that, um, then you're able to ensure that through call, we're going to work with colleges and all those different partners, partnering together to ensure that people are ready for the workforce. Um, I've been attending the Monotaw Regional Economic Development Committee meetings. And it's very interesting because they have people that will fit in from various uh, stakeholders, various agencies and such, and everything from 
Central Missouri Community Action members that were sitting in on those meetings, to business owners, to bank owners. And so when you have all those, you know, bank owners who can uh, give uh, loans to someone who's going to be trained to maybe instead of going into the workforce, start their own business. And so being able to bring together all the different stakeholders to be able to give, um, you know, to have those partnerships and those collaborations, we're going to need to do that because at the end of the day, um, you know, people have to make tough decisions at home. Like I mentioned in my childhood, um, when folks are, when you're making, struggling to make ends meet, every single dollar counts and every single additional tax is tougher on the family. So when you're able to ensure that you can do collaborations and work together in the community without increasing taxes, that is what my goal is going to be and that is going to be my uh, plan to ensure that, again, you have those efficiencies with everyone working together. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on now to some questions about the University of Missouri. Um, and Sarah, I'm going to let you uh, read this one. Uh, the University of Missouri is the state's flagship educational institution. How would you work with your colleagues and the administration to protect core funding and the strategic initiatives of the university? Well, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Missouri. I have a master's in public affairs from the University of Missouri. I also worked on campus for the University of Missouri, and so I know what it's like to, um, you know, what, what the, at the time that I worked there, there had been some different cutbacks and things. And so I know that it's very difficult. And so we're, we're, we are in a tough funding situation, as was mentioned before. Um, but what I want to do is work with members in the legislature um, here to ensure that we can fight for the things, um, the, at, at the bottom, at the end of the day, the University of Missouri is an economic engine, and it is creating so many jobs. As I go door to door in the district, so many people that, that work, live here in the district work for the University of Missouri. And the University of Missouri has impacts that affect our whole state. Um, the research that they're doing with the research reactor to be able to maybe someday cure cancer. So I will work with members in the legislature to get funding for the University of Missouri and to work on smart collaboration in ways that um, you know that may not at the, at the that may accomplish the same task, but at the same time also may not cost more. It's just working smart. Thank you, Michaela. How would you work with your colleagues and the administration to protect the core funding? So I can reject the premise of the, my discussions of increasing revenue being about new taxes. It wouldn't be about new taxes. It would about, be about reinstating taxes that were not a burden on our businesses prior to the economic meltdown of 2008. We had big multinational and multi-state businesses that were paying their fair share of taxes to be part of our community. And now we have the University of Missouri had to take a 9% cut and lay off hundreds of workers this year, particularly because the most recent round of tax cuts um, was significantly and wildly more expensive than our state legislature led us to believe that it was going to cost. And instead of talking about undoing that, that tax, we're gonna let four more years of a slow phase-in come into place, which you can't tax cut your way to prosperity. We can just look right next door at Kansas, who bankrupted themselves with continuing tax cuts that didn't lead to greater job growth or greater business benefit. Instead, it just led to more money going into the pockets of multinational corporations that were stashed overseas and Cayman Island bank accounts, instead of being reinvested in our communities like we're, we're told is going to happen. Um, and so we need to really be looking seriously at, at reinstating those taxes that used to be in place so that we can continue to support our university system. I mean, the top six goals of the chamber here request more than half a billion dollars in investment in the state of Mizzou, in, in Mizzou uh, for just here on our flagship campus. It doesn't talk about how we need to be investing in our K-12 institutions. You know, the three largest public school districts that are in the 50th district, the state skipped out on a bill for $10.7 million for transportation funding. And again, withholding two, $250 million in state funding, <coughs> there's no way that we can fund all these great projects if we don't talk about raising revenue. Um, there is no pork and fat in the budget left to be cut. I mean, that's why you see such essential programs like prescription drug benefits for seniors. That's critical to their survival being cut. If that's pork, um, I, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. Thank you. Uh, we're going to continue uh, the question in that same vein. Uh, both of you have probably heard that the University of Missouri system is considering what is called a translation precision medical complex that would help advance 
uh, MU research and educational outcomes. The price tag that was announced a few years ago on this initiative was $120 million. How would you support, or would you support, uh, that effort, and how would you work with the university and the community to make this a reality? Should I say again? Yeah, I'm going to start. Okay. Um, so, again, see, these are all really great projects that would lead to great great things in our local community here, expanding the, use, the efforts of the university, expanding medical care access here in Boone County, and collaborations between the university and the medical community are all wonderful things. Um, but you can't squeeze blood from a turnip. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that how do we make these choices without, again, looking at how do we increase revenues for the state? And we've been promised again and again that these big corporate tax cuts are going to lead to increased revenues, and every year they don't, we fall short. Um, and I want to see all of these great projects put into place, because they would be such a benefit to our children, to our, our community, and to our business owners. Um, as you bring in these good paying jobs for these big projects, um, particularly medical jobs and research related jobs, those are people that have money to spend in our community, because those are the best kinds of jobs. Those are the jobs of today and the jobs of the future. Um, that you're going to actually see growth in. Um, and those are the kinds of industries that we need to be attracting here to Boone County and to Columbia, um, because that's how we grow and we get better. Um, but we can't do that without baseline levels of funding. Um, and we are in a really bad place in the state legislature, and it's because we have been catering to big business interests that aren't even looking out for our, our small businesses, our local communities, and our local businesses. Um, because a lot of our local businesses, other than helping to fund the lobbyists that come from the Chamber of Commerce can't afford to send their very own lobbyists down to Jefferson City to make sure that their interests are getting represented. Um, and I know for sure that the workers and the people of this district aren't able to afford to send the lobbyists down to Jefferson City to make sure that they're heard. Thank you. Sarah, the question is, the University of Missouri was considering a precision medical complex a few years ago that would advance research and educational efforts price tag a few years ago was $120 million. How would you support this effort and work with the university and the community to make this a reality? Well, the University of Missouri, my understanding of what that project is, and I, I, I won't uh, admit or won't say that I, that I know the ins and outs deeply about it, but my understanding of what I saw in the paper is that but the, of all things, the University of Missouri right now, what is working so well and what is, how, what, what is so successful with our University of Missouri is the healthcare. Um, they are they are bringing in researchers. They are hiring faculty. It is growing. It is doing really well. And so, um, when, and and, uh, and from the little that I understand about what the um, uh, what, what this uh, TPN does is that essentially it could reduce healthcare costs. So instead of raising more taxes, ultimately in the long run to pay for things, if healthcare costs less, then that's gonna be a ripple effect throughout society because they're able to, they're, they're, these, this research is, is helping to target and find out, for instance, people who, um, to, to, to apply the treatment uh, based on what the what susceptibility the person may have to a certain disease. And so if they're able to, uh, to, to, to find that out, then they're able to apply the, 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 the uh, treatment or prevention techniques to then address that exactly disease instead of just applying medicine and treatment to just everybody. So, um, so that's going to help them be able to really zone in and overall that's going to really affect Missouri and the world. So I will work uh, again with members, with uh, my colleagues in the legislature to um, work towards funding and to, to collaborational per, uh, thing, me methods that we can use. Again, to collaborate and, uh, and, and eliminate um, uh, you know, streamline things. The, the neat thing about them having everybody too in this one building is uh, you know my undergraduates in business and marketing, and it's removing information silos. And so if you've got researchers from various ways <coughs> in, in the, the vet school, and med school, and everybody in the same building, they're able to collaborate and come to solutions. Thank you. We're going to let you take the next question to lead off. Uh, this question has to do with school funding for elementary and secondary education. Uh, just this year, the governor has withheld an amount of money provided in the budget for school transportation. Columbia Public Schools, in an effort to find ways to be more efficient and save taxpayer money, has suggested the creation of a pilot program. This program would encourage school district, school district to explore partnerships with local <coughs> communities to utilize their public transportation 
to create cost savings and increase ridership for the city. Do you support this effort, and would you be willing to co-sponsor this legislation? Absolutely. Anything that's going to re reduce um, uh, inefficiencies and that's going to create more efficiencies and that's going to be collaborations and that's going to be less cost for the taxpayer and to our citizens at the end of the day, I will absolutely support. It is so important um, for us to be looking, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier, that we're, we're to be looking for collaborations and those partnerships where we can save money and do good things and still continue the work, but again, be a good steward of people's tax dollars. Um, I work for uh, the, the state auditor's office as one of my jobs, and again, rooting out fraud, waste, and abuse, and finding um, where money is spent, and being a good steward of people's tax dollars. I'm passionate about that. And so whether it's a business that's paying taxes or whether it's uh, you know a homeowner paying taxes, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that every citizen's taxes are being used wisely. So the question is, uh, this year the governor withheld an amount of money that was provided in the budget for school transportation. Uh, Columbia Public Schools in an effort to find ways to fund that um, are exploring a partnership with local communities to utilize the public transit to create cost savings and to increase ridership in the city. Do you support this effort and would you be willing to co-sponsor legislation? Yes, and absolutely. So working on these uh, intergovernmental partnerships are a really great idea. Um, and being able to use city buses that might not otherwise be in use to transport our high school students to and from school is a really great idea. But that works well right here in Columbia, but that doesn't work well in Ashland, and that doesn't work well in Prairie Home or Jamestown or California where they don't have good public transit systems like we have here in Columbia. And so while that's a good patch for Columbia Public Schools, that's not a workable solution for the vast majority of school districts across the state. Um, and it's really not a workable solution for the vast majority of school districts that are within the 50th House District. Um, and the solution of working with the public transit system here in Columbia really only works for a small portion as well of those public school students that are going to Columbia Public Schools because the, the size of the Columbia Public School District is really outsized for what one would imagine uh, a, a local regional school to be because it does include so much rural area around the city itself. Um, and so that's, it's a, it's a half measure and it's a great place to start to help relieve the burden from Columbia Public Schools uh, personally and individually, um, but that's not going to address our public transit and our school transportation funding problems for the rest of the school districts in the 50th House District and across the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to let you respond to this next question uh, first. Uh, Governor Brighton's appointed committee on simple, fair, and low taxes released their findings to the public on June 30th. Governor Nixon had a task force in 2010 that recommended a number of the changes similar to this recent panel. What recommendations would you enact? Now, I'm trying to remember correctly what all was included in that, if that included um, just the in allowing for taxes for internet sales, or if that also included the complete elimination of corporate income taxes, um, if that was the whole package. Um, but so, leveling the playing field for our retailers, uh, if we're talking about allowing for sales taxes on internet purchased goods, that's absolutely something that we should be doing. Because our economy should be fair for all businesses that are operating in the economy. And so if you have big online retailers like Amazon who put a lot of book, booksellers out of business um, and has put a lot of clothing retailers out of business and, and other places, other small businesses because they're able to offer products at a, at a cheaper price without, because you're not having to pay the sales tax on it. Um, that's an unfair advantage for those internet sales companies and so we should absolutely be leveling the playing field. Now if we're going to be talking about that whole package of tax programs uh, that that he put out in, in that big memo, um, I would absolutely disagree with the complete elimination of corporate income taxes. Again, all you have to do is look right next door at Kansas, and they were losing teachers with, without any kind of funding to be able to bring them back in. Their school districts were suffering because they weren't able to pay their teachers sufficiently. Their roads were crumbling. The only roads that were uh, even maintained at all were toll roads. You have, have a significant degradation of their infrastructure system jobs leaving instead of jobs coming into the, into, the, into the state because they don't have a workforce that can actually afford to buy anything. Um, and we're not having that, in, that investment in our local communities. And so I would absolutely disagree with that. 
Um, we shouldn't be placing the entire burden of funding those basic needs of our state government and the basic needs of our communities only on the workers. Um, businesses get a benefit out of having good roads and having good schools because that's where you get products to and from your business and you get good workers. Um, and so all of our businesses should be helping to support those needs as well. Thank you. Sarah, the question is, Governor Brighton's appointed committee on simple, fair, and low taxes released their findings to the public just a few days ago. Governor Nixon had a task force in 2010 that recommended a number of changes similar to what was announced by the recent panel. What recommendations would you work to enact? Well, tax credits, I mean, this is um, a subject where there are some tax credits that are not performing. There are other ones that are doing well. Again, like I mentioned before, being a watchdog of your tax dollars, being, uh, ensuring that uh, you're be, we're being a good steward of your tax dollars, ensuring that we're being efficient and making wise decisions and realizing that you work hard to earn those dollars and that at the end of the day, it's your money. So I will, um, you know, I will look at, uh, you know, the details of that and discuss with my colleagues because there may be, um, you know, because tax credits are, are, uh, are a good uh, tool but some of them, um, again, if they're not efficient, if they're not effective, well, then we need to take a look at that. But the ones that are working and the ones that are doing good and that are creating jobs and that are um, helping uh, to make a good uh, investment in um, our future and in our communities, well, we need to keep those. And so, again, it's all about, um, just like you make decisions sitting down at their your table with your family as to what's the best decision for your family, and um, the government needs to do the same. And so. I will work hard to, again, be a good steward and to make work for my colleagues to make wise decisions. Sarah, thank you. Uh, we're going to continue with you, and we're going to continue on the topic of tax cuts. Uh, the implementation of tax cuts enacted by the General Assembly in 2014 will begin to be phased in during 2018 tax year. What positive or negative effects will these changes have for families and small businesses? As we mentioned before, um, anytime people are able to keep more of their money, they're able to invest that in their communities. And so, I mean, back when I was a child, I touched on this earlier, if, if the, the price of something goes up because the tax went up on a business and it filters down into the price of the product, um, again, then families are then happy to buy more things at garage sales. They're not able to buy things new. I mean, you make these real decisions as a family when you, when you live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and so I, it's your money. And so at the end of the day, I will work to ensure that you can keep your money because I believe that you know how best to spend it. Um, whether it's inviting a neighbor over to a Christmas dinner who has no family nearby and you've got a little more money to be able to pay for that. Or maybe you're able to get a little more money so as a business you're able to hire another employee or give them a little Christmas bonus, bonus like a ham or something like that. Um, it all makes a difference. And ensuring that you're able to, that those are directly spent in the community. And so I, I will fight for you in the legislature to, um, to be able to have those, and I would support that. Okay, thank you. Michaela, the question is, uh, the implementation of tax cuts that were enacted by the General Assembly in 2014 will begin to be phased in in 2018 tax year. What positive or negative effects will these changes have for families and small businesses in the industry? So I think that this tax cut that's going to be phased in is largely actually going to be very harmful to our local communities and to our local businesses. Um, because when you look at this new tax cut that's going to be phased in, uh, families making less than $60,000 a year are only going to get about $57 a tax year still that's going to stay in their pocket instead of being paid into taxes. Whereas families making a million dollars a year or more are going to get an $8,000 tax cut. And I don't know about you, but I would be more than willing to pay an extra dollar a day to make sure that my kids can go to a good school, that I can drive on decent roads. Um, because again, those are things that we have to pool our resources together to make sure that we can do and, and make sure that we have those available for all of us to use. Um, and those that have the most, you know, it's from, from each uh, according to ability and, and to each according to need. Um, and so again, our, our rural communities end up having more need. And our, our wealthiest families in the state, you know, again, those making a million dollars a year or more, I can't imagine there's more than, at most, maybe one or two folks here in this room today uh, that would be getting that $8,000 a year tax cut. Um, and so those are, those are families that, that might be an extra vacation, but what does that take
taking out of our local school district? What is that taking away from our community and from our children, um, from our ability to function as a, as a society? Um, you know, we have, again, the $10.7 million in school transportation funding that the state has skipped out on paying their bill, that is stuck with our local communities instead. What else should our communities be doing for our school children if they weren't having to pick up that tab for transportation funding? Um, and it's only going to get worse. You know, you're going to end up seeing the state's only paying about 18% of transportation costs instead of the 75% that they're required. We're getting ready to get to, they withheld some this year, and they're going to withhold more next year where they're not going to pay the transportation costs at all, which again is disproportionately hurtful to our rural communities. Okay. Michaela, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about economic development. And this question is, uh, how do you see uh, the role of government in incenting small business attraction and expansion for your district? So I think that there is, so one of the things that we've been working on here in Columbia and in Southern Boone County is expansion of the airport. Um, and so that's something that actually incentivizes additional small businesses to locate here without having to directly um, subsidize their, their coming um, by having those good transportation options available. Um, and that's a good a good example of a public-private partnership that really worked well. We've had public, we've had private investment in the expansion of the airport. But we've also had a very specific and directed tax. Um, it's the the lodging tax that actually is bringing in that revenue based on people that are coming in through the airport to actually visit here in Columbia. Um, and so it's a very very targeted and doesn't put an additional burden on our local communities. Um, but so we have to take a careful balancing approach with how we incentivize businesses to come that doesn't end up hurting our businesses that are already here. Because if you provide overwhelming incentive for new businesses to come, our long-standing and existing businesses, they don't have that opportunity, they don't have that option. And so they end up with higher prices or higher overhead, they end up with less profits in their buildings and in their businesses because they don't have access to those, to those same kinds of incentives. And so you have to kind of be careful about how you do those and how you structure them. Um, especially when you have well-established, you know, so if you're talking about small mom and pops and maybe doing um, subsidized loans um, for those folks to be able to get started, that would be a great option and, and a great way to grow a small business. But if you're talking about really successful businesses that have franchises in other states or elsewhere in our state, they're clearly they have a successful business model that if there is a demand and a need here in our local community, they should also be able to be successful without uh, taxpayer dollars subsidizing um, their business bottom line. Sarah, the question is, what would you see the role of government in incenting small business attraction and expansion for your district? Well, as I go door to door and talk to businesses in the district, um, what they're telling me is, again, the, the overburdening regulations and the mountains of paperwork that they have to deal with. So incentive, I mean, less, less, less government, we want people to be able to, I want people to be able to work hard at their businesses and not spend time filling out papers as much as possible. I mean, obviously we all want, um, you know, there's basic things and basic uh, uh, regulations that are good, but I will push back against things that don't make sense in the district. And I, um, upon being elected, I'm gonna put together a collaboration of working with chambers of commerce, working with business owners to sit down and we're gonna sit down at a table and we're gonna look at what is the most difficult thing, the challenge that government is in your way. How is government in your way and how can we get it out of your way so that you can hire more people, so that you can grow, so you can expand. And so, um, you know, and again, common sense solutions, some is good, but when businesses are saying that they're spending so much time on paperwork and they just feel like it'd be easier to just go out of business than it would to just continue with all this burden, um, that there's something wrong. And so I'm going to, again, like I said, sit down with businesses, we're gonna come up with solutions, and we're gonna make it happen together. Um, because this is, this is your government. And so that's what we're gonna do, and I'm really looking forward to that. It's gonna be very interesting and exciting, and we're gonna come up with all sorts of solutions because the people in our district are they, they've got wonderful ideas, and so we just need to listen to them. And we need to sit down and, and come up with uh, some solutions. So I will work uh, hard for that. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up question, and we'll let you respond to this first, the Missouri Technology Corporation and the Missouri Innovation Center has seen massive cuts in funding. Both entities are responsible for providing infrastructure and resources for early-stage, high-growth companies that are developing breakthrough technologies. 
what steps would you take to build a coalition to ensure Missouri reinvests money back into these efforts? Well, the same thing as I was saying before. Um, it's just collaboration. It's, it's getting together at the table and finding out what we can do and working with our uh, working with my colleagues in the legislature to be able to come up with solutions together. We're not, we're not going to come up with, these are not going to be easy solutions, but we can do it together. And um, I've worked, um, the, the, these types of decisions, um, I've, I've worked in all three sectors, public, private, and nonprofit. Um, my background that I bring to the table is that I've worked for a factory. I experienced a factory layoff working for Maytag in Jefferson City. And I've worked for nonprofit organizations. And I've worked for businesses. And so working for the state, for the auditor's office, and as a legislator assistant, all these different uh, 20 years of, ex of work experience that I bring to the table, working with people of all variety of backgrounds and uh, from all sorts of, in of industries. And so I will work together for us to come up with solutions, come to the table to be able to, um, to, to, to make uh, good sense and good policy in Jefferson City. Thank you. Michaela, the question is, the Missouri Technology Corporation and the Missouri Innovation Center have seen massive cuts in both entities are responsible for providing infrastructure and resources for early stage high growth companies that are developing breakthrough technologies. What steps would you take to build a coalition to ensure Missouri reinvests its money into these efforts? Absolutely. So I think, and it kind of goes back to what I've talked about with each of these answers, and, and really it's acknowledging the elephant in the room, which is campaign finance reform. Um, because we end up with so much that doesn't get done in our state legislature that despite the best intentions of a lot of people that are down in Jeff City, um, you end up with people who are beholden to their campaign donors. Um, big, big campaign donors, you have a lot of money coming through Jeff City. I mean, working there as a staff attorney for the Missouri Senate, um, you know, Sarah was talking about reducing regulation. Well, our state legislature has actually been guilty of targeting specific businesses for <laughs> over-regulation specifically to keep them out of the state. When I was working in, in the state Senate Research Office, I had a bill that came across my desk that even had the name of the company that was being targeted, and we'll call it Loser Company. And it went up to the, it went up to the floor of the Senate, and the sponsor of that bill wouldn't even acknowledge that he was picking a business that was going to lose in the state of, the, of, in the state of Missouri, that wasn't going to have a chance to be successful. Because when asked by another senator, wait a minute, is this bill about loser company? He looked them directly in the face and said, no, of course not. And I knew as a staff person, took everything I had in me sitting at that table to not stand up and call, then say liar. Because they knew what they were doing, that they were picking a business to not be able to have that chance to be successful here in Missouri. And so when you have lobbying organizations that are pushing the direction of legislation down in Jeff City, you end up where you have entrenched monopolies, where you have inability for new businesses, new startups to be able to be successful. And so that's why you find cuts to funding like the technology se sector, where those businesses, if their funding is available, could be competitors to long-standing businesses that have, um, have lobbyists available to them. And so I would like to push back on that to make sure that every business has equal opportunity to be successful here in Missouri. Okay, thank you for your answers. We're now going to move to closing statements, and each of you will be given two minutes uh, to have a closing statement. And Michaela, I'm going to start with you. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here today. Um, again, my name is Michaela Skelton, and I'm the Democratic candidate for Missouri's 50th House District. Um, I want to be a member of our legislature because I want to see our legislature be an active part of our community that's making sure that our ec economy is fair for all businesses and for our workers, that makes sure that we have the basic needs that we have to be a well-functioning society and community, um, and making sure that we're there to step in and fill the gaps when there's a need, when there are emergencies, and make sure that we are functioning well and not being bought by big moneyed interests that are not out for the, to protect or to help our local communities and our local citizens and our workers, our families and our children. I want to see Boone County continue to thrive and flourish. I want to see the whole of the 50th district continue to have that small town feel in all of our rural communities that's so important that I grew up loving. Um, because those communities are, are wonderful and beautiful and they have just as much right to be successful in this state as 
larger communities in St. Louis, Kansas City, here in Columbia that have that greater concentration of wealth and of business. And so I want to see everyone have a fair shake at really being able to succeed here in Missouri. And we need to make sure that our state legislature is held accountable um, and really start working and pushing back on the majority that has tried to tax cut us to prosperity and it hasn't come. Um, it has not been delivered to us and so many of our communities are suffering uh, for want of basic services and, and for want of competition and ability for businesses to actually survive and thrive. They have Prairie Home, which is a little town of 250 people over in Cooper County. It used to have two grocery stores and we had Walmart moved in into Boonville and it killed both of their local businesses and now they're beside themselves with glee that they have a Dollar General that doesn't even sell fresh produce. And that's not fair competition in our economy. That's not, that's not fair market share. Um, and that's not something that makes things work well for our whole community. Thank you very much. Senator, you'll have two minutes for your closing statement. I'm Sarah Walsh, and I'm the Republican candidate running to serve as your state representative in Missouri's 50th district. I grew up here in the Missouri. I've graduated from the University of Missouri. I got my bachelor's in business with Columbia College. I worked full time to earn my undergraduate degree and to earn my master's degree. I know what it's like to work hard. I will work hard for you in Jefferson City. I've been working for the past 20 years of my life. I've worked in all three sectors, public, private, and nonprofit. I lost my job at a factory layoff. I know what that's like. I want to work to keep jobs and to bring jobs here to Missouri. As I go door to door throughout the district, so many people in the district they, they tell me they, they, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for employment. I'm keeping a list, and when I get elected, and in the meantime, I'm trying to help them find jobs, but when I go get elected, I will help connect them with businesses in the district that, are, that, are, that have jobs and job opportunities. I, uh, my, my three priorities are jobs, education, and public safety. Jobs, I will work with small businesses as you, as you work and are job creators in our community and as you do so much for our communities. I thank you for sponsoring uh, Little League tournaments and for all that you do in the communities. What would we be if not for our businesses? I will work hard for you to, for, 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 for low taxes and for common sense things and for things that won't hurt you. And I thank you for what you do in the community. On education, I will invest in our schools. <coughs> uh, far and wide throughout the district, people love our schools and I will work hard to invest in them and ensure that every child has the opportunity to have a world-class education and to live the American dream. Public safety. I am so thrilled um, with the, the hard work that our law enforcement officers are, are, are doing throughout the district. And I have the highest respect for them, and I will fight for them in Jefferson City. I'm honored to have been endorsed by the uh, Corrections Officers Association, by the Missouri Cattlemen's Association, and by the uh, Columbia Police Officers Association. I thank you very much. My name is Sarah Walsh, and I'm running to serve, and I will appreciate your vote August 8th. Thanks. Thank you very much. This concludes our uh, candidate uh, forum today. Uh, please remember to vote on August 8th, and please give consideration to the answers that you heard today. Uh, this concludes our forum, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>